Okay, well, it's half past five UK time now. Um, so we'll kind of maybe we can start talking a little bit um, and, and let people come in as well. Um, but a, a very warm welcome to everybody. And it's, it's fantastic to have you all here for, for this book launch. Um, just a few sort of matters of housekeeping. Um, I think you you are automatically muted. Um, please keep yourself muted as when people are talking, but absolutely in when in the question time, feel free to to raise your hand and and unmute yourself and 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 um, and, and ask questions. Um, the event will be recorded, um, so if you don't want your face to appear um, and your video to appear, please maybe take your video off. Um, so, um, other people who couldn't be here so that they can they can listen to to everything. Um somebody had their hand up already. I don't know. Uwa, <laughs> hi. I don't know if, if you wanted to sorry say something. About that. Sorry, sorry. Oh, not to worry, not to worry. But you know that's yeah, if, if you want to ask questions, please you can use the chat function or you can um raise your hand and, and we'll and we'll do that. Um so so a real pleasure to to have you all here today for for the for um this book launch. Um just to let you know that this is the, the last open seminar probably of this academic year. There may be one in May, but we're, I'm just sort of working out if that's going to happen or not. Um, but but it's it's a, a really nice way to end off a kind of full um, two terms of, of talks um, this year. So um, really pleased to have this event this evening. Um, and also just to say that this event is also being um, retransmitted by the Lipsic Lab um, at USP in Brazil. So the colleagues who are joining us from there, a warm welcome, and we're really pleased to, to have you, and um, hopefully you can hear us loud and clear. Um, okay, I think um, we've got quite a few of us here, so maybe I'll start with introducing our speakers. Um, and we have four speakers today, three, three or four, I think. Um, well, let me let me start with um, with Matt Fitch, um, who is a professor of psychoanalytic studies um, at the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies at the University of Essex. Um, he's also editor of the journal Psychoanalysis and History. Um, and his, recently, his critical life of Sigmund Freud uh, was published by Reaction Books um, in 2022. And he's a trainee of this at the site for contemporary psychoanalysis and an academic associate of the British Psychoanalytical Society. Uh, Raluca Saranu is a professor of psychoanalytic studies, um, also here at the Department of, of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies. Um, and she's also a psychoanalyst and member of the Circulo Psicanalitico uh, of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, she, between 2022 and 2027, she's leading um, a big interdisciplinary research project called FreeSci. Um, about free clinics, um, a, psychoanalysis, a psychoanalysis for the people, um, which is being funded by UK KRI um, research grant. So that's very exciting. Um, and we're also pleased to welcome um, Jakob, Jakob Starberg, who is a practicing psychoanalyst and psychotherapist and a member of the International Psychoanalytical Association. Um, he's an assistant professor um, in comparative literature at um, Soderton University, um, south of Stockholm. And uh, he's currently working on a project that seeks to rethink the genealogy of psychoanalysis. And uh, last but not least, we welcome Jenny Wilner, who is an assistant professor for comparative literature at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Um, and currently she's, she's completing her second monograph, which discusses the political dimension of phylogenetic speculation in Forensi and Freud. Um, so really pleased to have these speakers with us today. Um, and I think Matt's going to, to introduce um, the evening a little bit more. Is that right? Um, um, no, Matt will intervene um, at the end. At the end. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm getting confused. Okay, so so I'll let you, I'll let your speakers take it on and I'll start recording um, from now. Thank you so much, Amelia. Yes, thank you, uh, Amelia. For Recording this. in progress. Thank you, Amelia, for this introduction and a big thanks to the department in Essex for hosting us this evening. And since this is our book launch, uh, Raluca Jacob and I also want to take the occasion to thank Adrian Harris, who wrote 
um, the foreword for our book, and also to thank everyone at the Leuven University Press who guided us through the production process of the book, particularly the editorial board, uh, where I will just mention two names, Beatriz Santos and, of course, Philip van Houten, whose idea it was in the first place that the three of us should write a book together. Now, Philip passed away last November, um, and we all wouldn't be here today if it weren't for him. The whole idea goes back to him, basically. This is why the book is also dedicated to his memory. I will start now with a few words uh, about the cover image of our book, which I assume all of you saw, at least when registering for this event. I'm thinking of the image of two female legs with laced boots that perform this kind of a pirouette over a fragmented landscape. It is a photo montage made in 1934 by the Berlin-based Dadaist artist Hanna Hoch. Um, that is H O with dots, C H Hanna Hoch. The title of this photo montage is Seven League Boots, which refers to the folklore of a pair of boots that allows its bearers to take seven leagues in one step at great speed to perform a perhaps magical past, a magical task, sorry. Now, in this particular photo montage, the legs are performing the leap from the right to the left, not from the left to the right, which spatially speaking means moving backwards according to Western iconography, or temporally speaking, moving towards the past. Um, as far as we know, Shando Ferenczi and Hannah Huch didn't even know of each other's existence, and yet her image corresponds at several levels with his thought. Firstly, the image of a leap backwards reminded us of Ferenczi's keen interest in regressive states in his patients, in his severely traumatized patients. Ferenczi sees regression as a reaction to trauma, as a form of survival. And then secondly, the spiraled shell that you perhaps saw around the crotch of these two legs, between the legs, basically, this spiral shaped shell of a snail or perhaps a mollusk, reminded us of an interest that Ferenczi shared with Freud over several years, biological speculation about the evolutionary history of the species and of their genitals. And this is very much related to catastrophe. It was during and after the First World War that Ferenczi immersed himself in popular biology. And at the same time, in a different place, directly after the world's first full-scale mechanized war, when the landscapes, the buildings, the human bodies were marked by destruction. And during this time, in a different place, the Berlin Dada Group was formed, of which Hanna Huch was later to become a member. Um, but this image on the cover of, of our book also bears another historical index. It was made in 1934 during Hannah Huch's inner exile during National Socialism and a year after Ferenczi passed away in Budapest. The third and perhaps most important correspondence between Hannah Huch's image and Ferenczi's thought um, has to do with form and technique. A photo montage is made out of cut out and arranged fragments, fragments that form something new. And, and to think of fragments in such a hands-on way, and I mean, I'm thinking scissors, uh, magazines, uh, rearranging uh, them with glue, <laughs> um, to think of it in such a way is helpful in order to discuss the theory of psychic fragmentation, which Ferenczi developed towards the end of his life and uh, Raluca will tell you more about this. Um, thank you, um, Jenny, and um, thank you all for being uh, here with us today. So um, I would like to spend a few moments um, thinking about the question, why um, engage and read um, Ferenczi today? So in the book, we're making a few moves to, to answer this question. 
Um, and I have very uh, uh, 10 very short answer answers to this question. So um, why, why engage Ferenczi? So first of all, because he talks, um, as Jenny evoked, about the psychic life of fragments. And here we have a very important revision of Freud. And uh, to a far greater extent than, than Freud, Ferenczi centered his thinking around trauma uh, and uh, showed how traumatic shock leads to radical forms of psychic splitting. Um, so he also talks about a, a subject who exists in fragments. Um, second, because uh, he talks about one of the most difficult topics uh, in psychoanalysis, which is the fusion and diffusion of the death drive. Um, and he um, finds surprising uh, psychic forms that are the result of the fusion and diffusion of the drives. And his observations are about complicated uh, forms of psychic death, that go alongside complicated forms of psychic survival. Um, then the third reason we engage in the book, because Ferenczi pluralizes um, our understanding of catastrophes, which are seen as both creative um, and destructive. So um, in the book, we, we capture this overlaying of catastrophes. So they're not only psychic catastrophes, but there are also uh, historical catastrophes and even ecological catastrophes. Um, fourth, uh, because I think he allows us a disposition that we call in the book, tragic optimism, um, which comes with a kind of astonishment in the face of the forms of uh, radical um, psychic plasticity. No, the, um, the strange forms that psychic life can take. Um, then a fifth reason, uh, which is very dear to us uh, in, in the book and in our conversations, is because Ferenczi is structurally open to an interdisciplinary conversation. Uh, we want to show him as a truly contemporary thinker who is open to questions of otherness, temporality, crisis or creativity. Then a uh, sixth reason is because he gives us a language to de oedipalize psychoanalysis. So there's a, a lot of insight and imagery that allows us to perform this kind of de oedipalizing gesture. Um, so in this book, we are fleshing out the insurgent uh, insights in, in Ferenc's theory. Um, seventh, because I would say he is a good phenomenologist, but also a good clinical empiricist. Um, and by reading closely the intricate text of the clinical diary, um, we get insights into how the psychic fragmentation can happen. Um, the eighth reason is because he reconfigures for us the relationship between psyche and soma. So he invents for me this kind of, and for us, I think, this kind of hyphenated form of psychosoma, where the historical, uh, hysterical symptom uh, becomes susceptible of forms of creativity or is, is creative um, and unfolds in its own language. Then the nine, ninth reason because we can read Ferenczi as well as a social theorist, a cultural theorist, um, and as a critical theorist. His metapsychology of fragments is embedded in an analysis of authoritarian structures. Uh, Ferenczi's insistence is, is that psychoanalysis should always aim for a dismantling of the father image. Um, and this is of particular relevance in the face of the violent return of the phantasm of authoritarian sovereign, sovereignty today. So our book seeks to pluralize the way of relating to a kind of political currency as well. Um, and the last reason I want to evoke uh, is perhaps a more unusual one, because currency starts from the sea. 
And I think that we in the book as well um, also start from the sea as a political act placing cultural history in an oceanic rather than terrestrial context. Civilization has been situated mostly in pastoral fields, in closed gardens and cities. So what happens if we start from the sailor and the swimmer, from the movement across oceans and from estrangements at sea rather than progressive settlements um, on land? And from sea critters, as Jenny Wilner insists, from creatures that would have preferred not to conquer land um, and who are not bound for glory. Thank you. And now I pass to Jacob. Um, oh, no. Uh, yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. And, and thank you for, for being here. Um, I'd like to say something about uh, the books, um, how it is manifested uh, in the form of dialogue. Um, first, perhaps some few words on, on, on the background. Um, for me, uh, it starts like 2018, going to a conference in Firenze, Italy, uh, hosted by Carlo Bonomi. Um, large uh, uh, manifestation of, of the rena Renaissance for 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 Ferenci, where I got acquainted with uh, Jenny Villa, and we sort of together um, listened to the papers and panels, and were especially thrilled to 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 hear um, Raluca talking on 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 the psychic lack of fragments. And late that year. Uh, Vilna Jenny uh, hosted a, a, a very uh, exciting uh, small conference in, in München where we all participated. And, and um, finally in Stockholm, I, I was uh, able to, to create a panel in, in a you know, larger conference. We, we held at Sertan University um, with the three of us. And um, the panel was uh, chaired by uh, Philip von Aute, who sort of um, challenge us to, to embark on this uh, intellectual uh, journey um, that eventually manifested in this book, Financial Dialogues on Trauma and Catastrophe. Now, the book situates the legacy of Ferenczi within a broad interdisciplinary landscape, including social science, literary theory, psychoanalytic theory, and clinical practice. Our book is the result of a three-year-long dialogue <clears throat> about the philosophical, political, and clinical implications of catastrophes in Ferenc's work, which we try to disentangle from our different in disciplinary points of view and against the background, background of social history. It was planned and written during the COVID pandemic, which put us in a very specific uh, position meeting on Zoom, not being able to travel, and finished during the month in which war in Europe became a dominating subject again. Our chapter addresses Ferenc's work in terms of thinking in times of crisis, considering the present in an uncanny constellation with scenes from the past, the outbreak of the First World War, the crisis of psychoanalysis as an institution, not least the disastrous loss encounter with Ferenczi and Freud, and the rise of fascism and national socialism, and the impending exile of the founding members of the psychoanalytic movement. Now, as we were processing this book, corresponding between different countries and disciplinary context, we came to discuss the effect of a radical plasticity, that is, the propensity to of mind to undergo change, both in terms of clinical imagery and political counter-narratives, in an attempt to mirror the distances as well as the encounters of our own working process, we decided to divide the book into three main sections, written from each of our different disciplinary angles respectively, and followed by brief responses from the two authors. Hence the title, Ferenczi Dialogues. 
with the turn dialogue, you can say it's a, it has a multiple origin, traced in, in different languages, discussion, dispute, a literary composition in the form of a conversation. The ancient Greek, uh, for them, the meaning to speak alternately to do converse. And if you break down the words, it goes from dia, through, and legain, speak. In other words, the prefix dia is not necessarily associated with the number of two, d. From the onset, we envisioned a triangular exchange. And this is reflected in the three sets of three-way engagement. So I, with that small remark, I give the word back to Jenny, I think. No? Oh, no, Raluca. 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 Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, so um, it, it was a bit like that with writing, the book, no, with passing a thread forward from one to the other. It always worked like that. Um, so each of the parts of, of the book is followed by responses from the other two. Um, so we worked with threes and nines a lot as our numbers. Um, and it's my, my privilege today um, to talk about Jacob's part, because um, we will not talk about our own parts, but we will talk about the others' parts um, in our presentation. So I will talk a bit about um, Jacob's part, um, which is also not his because we respond to it, uh, me and Jenny. So yeah, um, it's called Instead of Language, Confusion, um, Sigmund Freud, Shandor Ferenczi. Um, so in this first part of the book, um, Jakob Staberg reflects, the, uh, reflects on the psychoanalytic and political milieu of Budapest and Vienna. In particular, he um, explores the complex relation between Ferenczi and Freud, um, departed, departing from a scene. It's a scene of a missed encounter, the last meeting between them in 1932, when Ferenczi read aloud his paper in which the notion of identification with the aggressor was introduced. Um, Jakob Staberg develops a new approach to the confusion between Ferenczi and Freud um, by showing their theoretical standpoints as colored by the transference um, between the two of them. Um, and the chapter is strongly theoretically orientated uh, by uh, thinkers uh, Deleuze and Guattari. By analyzing the different aesthetic atmospheres of their dreams, of Freud and Ferenczi's dreams, so it's a sort of comparative analysis of dreams as well, this part, um, as, as the dreams are depicted in, in the analysis, investigating in particular the biological imagery they are containing, Jakob Stabergs deepens uh, the understanding of their theoretical positions pertaining to the consequences of Ferenc's reformulation of uh, genital theory. The reading of a concrete scene and its consequences reflects not only Ferenc's position in the psychoanalytic movement, but also the tensions within its environment as expressed in the forms of authoritarianism, in notions of masculinity and male bonding in light of impending political dangers. In this way, the chapter seeks to articulate the traumatic elements of transference phenomena that dominated the environment of uh, Freud and Ferenczi. Um, so what does uh, Jakob Staberg's chapter do? Um, I think it does so many things, but I will here focus on mainly on two of them. Um, so I would like to start from this very powerful um, formulation, idea, image, the tactile eye, which appears and reappears in Jakob Stabert's writing as part of his genealogical method. What is important here for contemporary psychoanalysis is the capacity to see and touch while circling or staying with a tactile eye, the possibility of a milieu, um, what, what Jakob calls milieu, 
which can unravel in the present and can generate the shape of psychoanalytic futures. As I ponder on the tactile eye, I believe this reading of a missed encounter promises a queering of psychoanalytic history and theory. Um, it makes an intervention, an interruption. It points to a transformational process. This is important because it allows us to invent new ways of thinking about relationality, about the many and beautiful forms in which a relation between two or several things can present itself to us. Um, so what Jakob Staberg arrives at um, is a form of touching across time, collapsing time through effective contact between marginalized people now and then. Such a queer historical uh, uh, touch can form communities across time. Uh, Jakob Staber unpacks the making of Ferenczi into a scapegoat, um, and this can help us traverse other exclusionary events and inclinations in the field of psychoanalysis, and perhaps we can talk about that. In my dialogue with Jakob Staberg, I thus wish for a queer spectrality, for a moment when the effective force of the past can erupt into the present, um, speaking of a desire from another time and placing a demand on the present in the form of an ethical imperative. What would it mean to write a theory of sexuality starting from a landscape that is beyond the phallus? Um, so uh, my second point about Jacob's um, part um, is that the tactile eye brings another way of knowing, a kind of tentacular exploration. Um, tentacles are neither fingers nor eyes. In her book, Staying with the Trouble, feminist thinker Donna Haraway talks about a new tactile mode of knowledge, tentacular knowledge. She reminds us that a, a tentacle comes from the Latin uh, tentaculum, which means feeler, um, and tentare, which means to feel or to try. In this book, in our dialogues, and in particular in Jacob's chapter, um, Ferenczi emerges, I believe, as a tentacular psychoanalyst and thinker, feeling, trying, experimenting, hesitating, advancing, retracting, and revising. The landscape in Stabert's chapter is one beyond the phallus. Um, it is a, a de-oedipalizing intervention. Uh, Jakob Stabert is attentive to such de-oedipalizing de moments in Ferenc's work. Um, and I would like to just briefly mention here the idea of amphimixis of eroticisms, which is combining two elements so that the third one, um, different one, can emerge. So tentacular vis visuality is a mode of making theory where the senses are creatively amalgamated so that the story told by Jakob Staberg contains the atmospheres of the beginning of the 20th century, but also letters, disparate notes, theoretical texts, boat journeys, gestures of turning away, sea creatures, silences, half secrets, noisy quarrels, erotic passions, unfinished analysis, dreams of archaic mothers and inner growths, and also father failures. Thank you. I pass to um, Jakob. Yes. yes. Th thank you very much, Raluca. I, I will continue this, 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 um, trying to to uh, give justice to Jenny uh, Villiers, Jenny Villiers uh, uh, chapter, and and, and then. Um, perhaps um, be able to 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 say something of my uh, response. And now this part is 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 called um, catastrophe and geniality. Ferenczi's Talasa and the politics of bioanalysis. 
Now, um, Jenna Wilner here guides us to an earlier uh, scene. Here, now we are at the, uh, we find ourselves in the Hungarian garrison town of Papa in, in, in 1914, uh, where Freud's theory of sexuality meet popular dominism in a soldier's library. Uh, in 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 uh, Jenna uh, Wiener's word, imagine an officer dressed in uniform, surrounded by soldiers, and immersed in the essays in which Freud blended his clinical view on neurosis with metapsychology and blurred the line between sexuality and perversion. Essays in which hysteria for a short period of time, almost, almost came to serve Freud as an anthropological paradigm. So here, Fierenschi uh, served as a chief medicine officer to an Hussarian squadron, in the beginning being free of time alternating between such activities as learning to ride a horse, uh, leisure reading in the library and translating three essays to Hungarian. Thus, Freud's theory of sexuality meet popular Darwinism in a soldier's library. These were the circumstances under which Fierschi drafted his first version of his theory of genitality in Talassa, which was to be published in 1924. Wilner offers here a new frame for reading Thalassa, challenging the perception that Fierschi and Freud sought to provide psychoanalysis with a national scientific foundation. Instead, her comparative reading shows how their bioanalytic speculations deconstruct precisely what claims such a founding status offer. Fierschi reads his sources from the 19th century popular biology, Lamarck, Heckel, Bölsche, against the green, combining a pathology of science with psychoanalytic literary theory. Wilner's reading foregrounds the diverging ideological implications of the language of biology, while Freud and Ferenc's immersion into pre-human history may seem like a retreat from political matters. Ferencian bioanalysis read against the back, read against the background of his time holds the potential of a political intervention against biologism and unionistic thought at a time when evolutionary theory begins to inform such projects. Talassa rewrites the terms of an entire discourse while using concepts drawn from psychoanalytic study of hysteria. Uh, Wilner quotes Ferenczi. First, he says, it is because Ferenczi, as opposed to elevating the laws of biology to a world principle, actually claims the interpretational sovereignty of psychoanalysis over natural sciences. In Talassa, psychoanalytic notions are the models for Bildner at stake. Ferenczi writes, I believe that as prototypes for Bildner of bioanalytic bio mechanism, the structure of neurosis and psychosis with which we are best acquainted will always serve. Now, what I would like to, to, to ponder on in my, in my response in this work is how Jenny Wilner um, puts out of join the relationship between biology and psychoanalysis. She presents us with a new reading of, you could say, old themes of what we perhaps think familiar. Freud and Fierenschitz's engagement with 19th century biology 
has often been read as an attempt to provide psychoanalysis with a natural scientific foundation. However, as Wilner shows, Fianchi's genital theory deconstructs precisely that which claims such a founding status. He reads his sources against the grain, she says. Now the same can be said about Wilner's own approach. She reads her sources against the grain. Now, what does it mean to read against the grain? In Wilner, let us say we encounter a new archivist, extracted through an approach of the archivist's thoroughness and keen eyes. Her reading pertains to a certain cheerful positivism. More important, it opens up a whole series of fields possible to explore. And at the core, core, we encounter an archivist who looks at her material with a certain astonishment. New theories, new territories seems to become available. And here I sense a broader intellectual landscape involving literary critique, political history, as well as psychoanalytic theory and implications for clinical practice. What is at stake, you could say, is a new way of thinking about forces. The way Wilner analyzes Fierce's work on hysteria, on thinking masculinity, reflects a certain experience of the body in terms of forces, the body's capability for transformation and survival as a response to overwhelming experience in Fianchi's writing gives us, becomes apparent in her readings. This artic articulating of forces, you could say, this new way of thinking organs that Wilner Brooks brings to the fore in Fianchi's writing allows us to see how Fianchi connects to a certain art of interpretation whereby activating such Freudian notions as overdetermination, deferred action, the body, organs and organisms themselves are approached, whereby the transformation that intersect them now can be articulated. Wilner's analytic uh, strategy makes it possible to see how Fianchi's speculative maneuvers are precisely effective deconstructions of a world of imagination according to which developmental optimism and the idealization of progress understood as biological necessity could nurture an aggressive nationalism as well as affirm the interpretative primacy of natural science. Fianchi's series of catastrophe, the notice of shock, Convulsion and acutest trauma replace here the wonders of nature, which was seminal both for Hecker's reception of Darwin and for Bölsch's narrative. Mm -hmm. Lastly, for psychoanalysis itself, Vilnius analysis becomes effective in that through this observation, it dismantles the supposed notion within the psychoanalytic milieu that Ferenc's critique of Freud could be undermined by reducing his thought to the product of a certain biologism. Wilner's reading shows how Ferenc's psychoanalytic work contains speculative models in which Freud's world of thought is at once challenged, challenged and taken to its extreme rather as a re-evaluation of all values. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. And I'll continue with trying to give an impression of the last part of the book, the main chapter written by Raluca Soriano. The title of her chapter is Catastrophe and the Creativity of Fragments towards a phenomenology of the scene of trauma. And this is the most clinical part of our volume. 
while reading it, you can basically feel that the material is drawn from the consulting room and that what is at stake in Raluca's chapter is how to approach the severely, how to approach severe trauma. Now, I'm not a psychologist, and there is a particular it is a particular challenge to work with Ferenc's images in literary and cultural theory. It is related to the perhaps more common challenge of trying to work with Melanie Klein. We're dealing here with a tradition of psychoanalytic thought that is less engaged in questions of interpretation than in methods and techniques of construction. But precisely this also belongs to the realm of a theory of language. So here we go. One of Raluca's leading thoughts is that trauma, if we think of trauma with parency, is to be understood less as an interruption of symbolization, less as a void or a gap or all that, and rather as an overabundance of images and of very specific ways of relating. Raluca puts Ferenczi's imagery to work, and these are images derived from biology, but also images derived from dreams and from hallucinations. We should not regard these images as metaphors, she holds, but as assumptions regarding the structure of the psyche. So Ferenczi maps out psychic layers and fragments. Departing from his clinical diary, Raluca continues this project, as it were. She too arranges and systematizes things and images, assuming that we may learn something, something crucial from the severely traumatized, namely that splitting is more readily available to the psyche than we are used to think. And this is why Raluca speaks of Ferenczi's metapsychology of fragmented psyches. So Raluca thinks with Ferenczi's images. This means that she, following Ferenczi, goes beyond Freud's model of the self, the id, and the superego by integrating fragments into the model. The clinical implication, she holds, is that we enter the domain of an eventful psychoanalysis where radical change is part of the clinical imagination. What does it mean to have survived a psychic catastrophe? Raluca speaks of a phenomenological reading of the creativity of psychic fragments. So this is about unconscious survival techniques with very dark implications. Sometimes, Raluca writes, splitting is so profound and results in such stable psychic fragments that the psychoanalytic process has very little to do with integration into something whole, but rather with a re-libidinization of deadened parts of the psyche that continue their life in fragments. Raluca further argues that for parency, the catastrophe is not a single unitary event, but a scene where several elements hold together and interact. And this means that we move away from the idea that parency somehow regressed to Freud's early theory of traumatic seduction. It's not that simple. Parency integrates the notion of a traumatic external impact with the theory of the wish while assuming the duality of the drives, the de death drive too, as in beyond the pleasure principle, but he takes it further from there and develops a more specific notion of the surprising techniques and the strange forms of psychic survival. Now, since Freud and Jones, Ferenczi's willingness to accompany his patients even into their psychotic hallucinations has sometimes been considered a psychotic trait in himself, a tendency to take dreamed up imagery and the language of biology at face value quite differently. Soriano underlines the implications of his use of analogies, how he switches between different registers. She articulates this as a method. Parents, he pays attention to marine beings, she writes, to their breathing techniques, and their ways of surviving by splitting themselves up. He speaks of wise organs. Quote, when the psychic system fails, the organism begins to think and asks, how can one physically maintain a beating heart in the moment of an attack? How can it be that the hallucination of breathing during somatic suffocation may enable survival? 
catastrophes set bodily functions and strange processes of representation in motion. And it was out of our dialogue about these matters and these questions that the idea came up to look closer at data montage in our introduction, while thinking about different ways of putting elements in relation here, here and now, we went 100 years back into the history of art, of politics, of science, and of psychoanalysis. Thank you very much. I hand over to Matt. Thanks. Well, I'm, I feel so honored to be called upon to comment on this book. And I'm also, um, I guess, speaking from a position of being sort of mesmerized <laughs> by the circular movement between you know, the, the three authors in dialogue. And I'm, I'm worried about um, mm -hmm. being out of step or spoiling the, the rhythm. But um, I, have, I have two things that I want to draw attention to. It's, a, as you can guess, I think it's a very hard book to to sum up because it's there's so much in it. It's so mobile, but I want to draw attention to two things, both of which have to do with the issue of reconfiguration. And the first has to do with reconfiguration in the name of the psychosocial. I see this book as inaugurating a new phase in the recovery and rearticulation of Ferenczi's work, taking the first phase as mainly occurring in the late 1980s to mid 1990s, which saw the republishing or translation of a number of key primary texts, especially the clinical diaries uh, and also the correspondence with Freud. And this was closely followed by the reappraisals of Ferenczi through many edited collections, such as Ferenczi's Turn in Psychoanalysis and Ferenczi for Our Time, which continuing into the present moment represent the reevaluations of Ferenczi as one of the major psychoanalytic thinkers. But this period of almost 30 years of delayed or belated Ferenczi reception has been dominated by the psychoanalytic Ferenczi, whether conceptual, clinical, or methodological. Its emphasis was on restoring his position as a key figure within the tradition and reevaluating his work as an alternative to Freud. More broadly, Ferenczi's work has contributed to a wider narrative about the Budapest school, or it's offered a retrospective anchor for contemporary relational trends and technique, or it's addressed the boom of interest in trauma and so on. So there's been a question of weaving back into the history of the movement, the missing threads that overcome his status as a marginalized figure and tie him more substantially into the ongoing practice of psychoanalysis. But what Ferenczi Dialogues does, I think almost for the first time, is it gives us the psychosocial Ferenczi, or Ferenczi for Psychosocial Studies, which is quite a momentous step. It doesn't mean merely showing how Ferenczi can be applied outside the clinic. In fact, that's not really a feature of these dialogues, applied Ferenczi. Rather, the book does for Ferenczi what was done for and by Freud right from the start which is to recognize the implied upheaval or transformation which psychoanalytic work potentially introduces into all the surrounding disciplines, because it brings with it a new way of thinking, not just within its own local domain, if psychoanalysis can even be localized in that way, but for all attempts to render human methodologies, human histories, human narratives, human philosophies. For Freud, this broad impact had to do with the unconscious, for Ferenczi, we could say, additionally, this has to do with trauma and catastrophe, the key terms in the subtitle to the book. And as the conversations in the book ably demonstrate, it's not that wherever an account of trauma exists, Ferenczi might be relevant. Will we introduce, sorry, rather, it's that by introducing Ferenczi, we render disciplinary formations traumatic we introduce the presence of trauma as an epistemological and methodological principle into the equation of disciplinary knowledge. So I see Ferenczi dialogues as introducing a psychosocial reconfiguration, not just because it's much more outward looking and truly interdisciplinary, as I think you, you'll have heard in the last half hour. At several points, the authors allude to their project to situate Ferenczi's legacy in an interdisciplinary landscape, which includes, in some versions, social sciences, literary theory, psychoanalytic theory, and clinical practice. 
But at other points, they name this as an intersection between literary critique, political history, as well as psychoanalytic theory, and also a gray zone between biology and politics. And I think it's important that there isn't a stable way of pinpointing this interdisciplinary convergence. It seems irreducibly mobile. level of intellectual method, though these abound too. Field as remote as possible, which grasps for analogies in alien scientific field, which is in turn put into dialogue with new materialist epistemologies in Donna Haraway and others. Or we hear the tactile eye that, that Raluca spoke about. Uh, and reading social relations, and there are many new concepts to discover, the asymmetric encounter, radical. But I think the psychosocial quality of the dialogue operates even more broadly than a new theory of the subject, a new imaginary. And this imaginary is no doubt complex and multifaceted. It will take time to absorb. But through all its component parts, it is recognizably Ferencian. And perhaps I shouldn't attempt new organizing principle centered on the language of catastrophe, in which I quote, several elements hold together in relation and interact, sometimes in a violent matter, in a violent manner, where certain structures and psychic positions are formed and others are destroyed. And these interactions are approached as fractures, splits, atomizations, pulverizations, leakages, detritus, but also new formations, protective membranes, expansions, contagions, and inner growths. So this is what I mean by thinking of this book in terms of a reconfiguration of the field. A best almost every page of the book, starting with the opening consideration of the image from Hannah Hoch that um, Jenny already treated us to, which disassembles the human form and combines it with something animal. There's no head, there are no arms. Insight on the opening pages, we never leave the terrain of the body transformed by the memory that the authors invoke radical plasticity as the ability to become whale and then become coral and then become cyanobacterium. We are a witness to Bolsha's startling description of a fish orgy, and we follow his invitation to remember how you were grotesque creatures without a trace of your form. We watch the gill slits appear on the... Park. Bow wow, bow wow. When I'm frightened of a dog, I become. Psychoanalytic theory is thus re embodied, Raluca comments on Jenny Vilna's section, even if the bodies are those of fish, squid, jellyfish, octopi, and amphibians, humans, or raccoons. But what's going on here? How do we read these insistent conjunctions between human and animal? We're told to drop the idea that this concerns the biologization of psychoanalysis, the attempt rather than Aggressive trend, longing of all living beings to return to pre human marine forms of life. 
but then how explain the way in which such regressive longing might give rise to actual somatic trans ad hoc protective bladders, vesicles, or pustulae filled with fluid, usually developed under the strain of the traumatic attack. So where does fantasy finish and materiality begin? This is one of the challenges the book poses for us, a reconfiguration of the boundary and the efficacy of psyche and soma, desire and organic form. An obvious model through which to read this challenge is drawn from Deleuze and Guattari's chapter on becoming intense, becoming animal, from their work, Mille Plateau, which is alluded to several times throughout the book. And indeed, it's a chapter which makes frequent reference to Freud's little hands, his becoming horse, and to Frenzy's own vignette of Arpad and the rooster. Note how children talk about animals, Deleuze and Guattari write, and are moved by them. It's not about representation, but about affect. We know nothing about a body until we know what it can do, what its affects are, and how these enter into composition with the affects of other bodies, assemblages, or sites of conjunction. So organs are thus liberated from their customary frames by ditching a dependence on the language of forms and concerning oneself instead with affects, intensities, and movements. The and Guattari write, you are a set of non-subjectified affects. You are a climate, a wind, a fog, a swarm, a pack, or at least you can have it, you can reach it, and so on. So a proximity to what Deleuze and Guattari offer here is recognized throughout the Ferenzi dialogues. But I would say something still separates Ferenzi's radical plasticity arising as a response to trauma from Deleuze and Guattari's invitation to becoming animal. You can have it, you can reach it. One encourages us to simply shed subjectivity, to lose the human form in its Oedipal harness by adopting new relationships between our parts and the particles around us. The other wrestles in a different way, I think, with the very limits and boundaries of what is possible for life and is in constant dialogue with the reality of an unwanted, imposed, shattering or violent invading of the psyche by another. Yes, the hysterical body is a body that has gained semi-fluid qualities, and it does so not because it is possessed by fantasy, but because the tissue, limbs, cells, and nerves speak a language of organs. These are considered hysterical materializations, but they happen under the pressure of traumatic encounters. Yes, Ferenzi in his clinical diary points to a process when different organs or body parts produce effects of thinking and are able to perform surprisingly minute calculations. But they do this in an extreme attempt to preserve life. As we've heard already, when the psychic system fails, the organism begins to think. So alongside Deleuze and Guattari, I would bring this powerful articulation of a pathos of transformation at the limits of what we can imagine for bodies and at the limits of what bodies can imagine for themselves, at the limits of the organic. I would bring this equally into dialogue with Theodore Adorno, who perhaps surprisingly defended Freud's biological term, his language of sexual instincts, his organic vocabularies, against the attempts of the neo-Freudians to free psychoanalysis from, and this is quoting Karen Horner, the limitation set by its being an instinctivistic and a genetic psychology, rather than one in which psychical life is determined by the socio-political arrangements of human beings and therefore capable of socio-political transformation. Adorno's rejoinder was firstly that the new totality of human character sought by the neo-Freudians was fictitious. One should rather call it a system of scars, which are integrated only under suffering and never completely. So this is perhaps one step in the direction of Ferenczi. But secondly, Freud's rooting of his theory of the individual in a kind of Hobbesian state of nature, and the attempt to naturalize this vision by embedding it deep in the archaic framework of evolutionary history, is for Adorno, a much more eloquent testimony to the social life we lead under capitalism, in which we are not free to simply step off the path 
and become this or that, to become whatever we could be. Instead, we live in a petrified universe of relations, which for all intents and purposes appears to us as, as fixed, as if it had been unearthed by a marine paleontologist in some deep oceanic recess. So although Adorno is a very different way of thinking about the relation between psychology and the kind of panorama of biology we get in Thalassa and in the Frenzy Dialogues, it evokes for me at least the sense of extremity in response to which Perenzi's thinking is shaped. It's not an idle fantasy, but fumbling at the very boundaries of how we allow ourselves to think of the body, to think of what is rooted in organic life and unchangeable, and to find there where we least imagine that, the possibility of change, of transformation. It involves a crazy leap of faith. And this is perhaps where it departs from Adorno's characteristic position. And I like this term, um, tragic optimism. Mm. Um, it departs from Adorno towards the animation of seemingly dead fragments, the restoration of life in the face of death or inertia, the interfusion of matter with something we are unable to credit with, credit it with, breath, change, desire. It's as unthinkable as the thinking lungs, Raluca mentions, lungs which are able to get air against all odds in the hour of a traumatic attack. The author, Parenzi's term for a fragment of the psyche endowed with hyperfaculties, is operative in moments of catastrophe. It is formed when death is very near, but it acts as an organizing life instinct. So this is how these ideas speak to me. If trauma is to be dealt with, it can't be dealt with purely at the level of what, what I will call the soft spaces, soft spaces of memory, psychology, history, sociology, even political justice, spaces to which much of humanity are routinely denied entry. Rather, with all the insistence of the pressure to move from death into life, the psychology of trauma has to reckon with the very depths of what we take to be natural structures, but which are essentially the solid, rigid forms into which our epistemologies and ontologies have, conge have congealed under capitalism or under white supremacy. So this is what I meant by reconfiguration um, in the second way, and what is at stake in reconfiguration. And it's really, the book's really set me thinking, and I don't know where these thoughts will end, but I'm, I'm gonna finish there and really, I guess throw the question back to the authors, and particularly, I mean, obviously you respond in whatever you, way you want, but I'd like to know if you feel that your experiment in Frenzy Dialogues is not just a kind of elaborate experiment um, that's only facing towards Frenzy, but could it be the start of, of a much bigger intervention um, into other disciplines in which Frenzy becomes a kind of way of thinking? Um, both within the clinic, but also outside the clinic. Yes, thank thank you so much, Matt. Um, it's such a beautiful and curious experience no, to take something that's already a dialogue um, and then, um, I guess, traverse it with a new sets of question. And I, I guess I, uh, I feel quite grateful at the moment, like I'm receiving something that turns the kaleidoscope, you know, and mm -hmm. turns the book around in new ways. Um, and I think that uh, to start from, from the end, because I have many thoughts and, and associations, the responses, and we can take a bit turns uh, in, in doing that and then open to the, mm -hmm. uh, to questions. Um, but I guess, um, yes, I, I think for myself, that is definitely, um, um, a, a project to think Ferenczi as a method. Mm. Um, so in, in many ways, so, and you captured um, several of them. So one has to do with um, thinking of his trauma theory as a theory of the subject. Mm. Mm -hmm. So mm. that's, um, that's one element of it. And I think um, that that is the politicized Ferenczi and the Ferenczi as you beautifully put it, no, that breathe is something uh, to the psychosocial or for the psychosocial, um, definitely. 
but then um, um, no, there's uh, there's another um, element of method in there, which again you captured um, around analogy mm-hmm. um, and working in parallel sets of relations. No, because this is why um, analogies mm-hmm. is not a simple comparison. Analogy is uh, establishing a relation between sets of relations. And I guess this is what we're interested in the book and perhaps beyond the book of continuing within this um, multiplication of relation in ways that can produce theoretical and clinical effects Mm -hmm. as well. Um, And um, then I I loved the the um the first um term you gave us i think it's such a ferencian terms in in many ways reconfiguration mm. um which is it's about something very particular again it's not very metaphorical it's about um using what we have to recombine it and to make something new mm. Um, so it's it's always this image of you take the detritus, no? The the traumatic scene produces a lot of detritus, a lot of dead parts, um, and some of them, I guess, we have to accept they're really dead and mourn them um, and let them be. But other of them are mobilizable in a new configuration. Um, so this is why, again, like my third thought, and I will stop here, and then maybe Jenny and and um, Jakob can can intervene. Um, that in a sense, uh, the what appears in the book at times is this idea of an eventful psychoanalysis, which I think for me is definitely grounded in Ferenczi, uh, but at the same time leaps out of him and is broader than Ferenczi. Mm-hmm. Um, and take seriously this idea of the event um, that, of course, in psychoanalysis, we are really committed to sedimented, slow work that happens from session to session to session and builds on on, on top of each other and is layered and continuous and so on. But there are certain thinkers, like um, in the Budapest school in particular, like Ferenczi and also Michael Balint, that offer us a kind of vocabulary that I think can lead to this um, re-evaluation of an event and of a radical transformation. Mm -hmm. Um, That out of this insistence, which is also slow, and so so the insistence in reconfiguring something in the consulting room is also um, slow and reiterative Mm -hmm. and searching for something. Mm But I guess the assumption is different. The assumption is that an event, a clinical event is possible. Mm -hmm. A psychic event is possible, just like a biological catastrophe is is possible. Um, And again, I I, I just want to end with this image, which Ferenczi offers, uh, which exactly captures the spirit of the book. The moment of the catastrophe in the Thalassa, when the sea... Uh, uh, dries out. And what happens is that the creature is forced to grow legs and grow lungs and sort of crawls onto the ground and Mm. and continues something in another form, Um, not because, uh, or because partly because they were forced to, no? I, I really liked what your association with Adorno and this not free and petrified, yeah. So mm-hmm. it, it's not a, a luminous opportunity for change. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a burden, extremity, of change. an extremity, yeah. Mm. Um, and I, I, I keep announcing that I will finish, and I will finish now. But I, I want to finish with something that I found so beautiful, and it's such a gift to to see this image here. Uh, when you were talking about transformation and at the limits of what we can imagine for bodies and what bodies can imagine for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the place where we try to write, or at least that's what I think. So now I've really finished. (laughs) And Jenny and Jakob, if you'd like to respond. 
I can continue perhaps. Uh, thank you so much for this, uh, Matt. It really, I only can only agree with Raluca. This is a real gift and I'm still uh, digesting, metabolizing uh, uh, what I've heard. And I particularly feel I want to reread Adorno again because what you said about Adorno defending Freud's allusions to biology, um, it goes together very well with I mean, I don't know exactly where he does this, right? But when he writes about Beckett, about Beckett's prose, but also uh, about Beckett's drama and about bodily fragmentations and about bodily fluids, even polarization, fragmentation, um, he's using a very Ferencian language, which has to do with radically endangered life. Um, and of course, also with the historicity of any kind of organic life, but also taking account into account the historicity of the ways in which we refer to these forms. So I, I really think that um, reading more Adorno, and I mean, there is a line of, of reception there over Erich Fromm, who uh, read Ferenczi and Adorno coming from there, you know, my Mises to the reified, it's also a very Ferenczi notion. I think it would be very helpful to to try to combine this even more um, with Adorno's and, and Benjamin's traditions um, uh, of thought. Um, Just to say, I, well, I found a, a, a note in one of, um, I think it was in one of Adorno's letters to Benjamin, where he says, you must read everything by Ferenc. Oh, really? That's <laughs> he, did, he did turn against him by the, by, by the, uh, by the later 1940s, but early on, he was recommending Ferenczi. Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, this, this, he must, he uh, must have this is this is wonderful news <laughs> because it, it <laughs> confirms my, my gut feeling. There is there's something very Benjaminian about Ferenczi, and Adorno seems to have uh, recognized this. Uh, Ferenczi is a strange, extreme figure <laughs> in the intellectual landscape, and such was Benjamin too, uh, the intellectual whose friends would never be able to unite at the table because they were all so eccentric and so different. Uh, th there is definitely uh, some kind of Wahlverwandtschaft going on there. Um, one thing that I, I wanted also to, to uh, connect to what um, both of you, uh, Matt and Raluca, said about creatures being forced to develop legs. Uh, I mean, they're not doing it for the fun of it. They're not doing it because of vitalism. That's that's the main important thought in in, in Ferenczi's uh, counter narrative of popular Darwinism. In a way, is that there is no vitalism in this. They do not want to conquer land. It is more like a neurotic reaction to a regressive drive that is triggered by a trauma. So it is a way of narrating this without any kind of vitalism or progressive optimism whatsoever. So this thinking of a leap backwards um, as a general trend uh, also goes together very well with the impulse of the angel of history in uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, uh, um, um, thesis um, uh, on history. Um, so, so this this is also something that I think is is uh, important in dealing with how Ferenczi deals with Darwinism and his sources. It is often um, told as a history of influence. He was influenced by Lamarck. Uh, he was influenced by Heckel, and I think it is a complete change of scene. He does something very different with the notions coined by Heckel by Lamarck. Uh, um, and um, in doing this um, and, and trying to narrate it in a different way, um, this I, I really think that we need this um, as as um, let's say it it there have been these new materialist readings, for instance, uh, by Elizabeth Wilson in Gut Feminism, which uh, Raluca makes very productive in trying to understand how we can think about um, these organic issues in, in a more structural way, so, so to speak. But in a way, I think that Raluca, in her way of working with this material, brings another, um, um, how do you say, Ebene, 
another level of reflection into it with Ferenczi, which actually, I think the new materialist debates, or many of them, could learn from. I, I think Ferenczi brings a kind of um, knowledge of the fact that there is no ideologically neutral language idiom in which we can refer to organic life. There is no neutral linguistic tool. He has this uh, uh, wonderful text in um, uh, Freud's Influence on Medicine, where he says, of course, the human body is a psychosoma. It is not just uh, occupied by something linguistic, but something surprising comes from the realm of the bodily as well, something that threatens to disturb our concepts. So it's not, of course, not Cartesian. But still, he says, we cannot be monists all too quickly, because then we would pretend as if we had a language in which we can represent the bodies that is neutral, that steps out of historicity, like a kind of meta language. And so I, I think he, 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 he uses a kind of strategic dualism that always reflects that a gap remains between our discourses and the matter we are speaking of. So, so I, I, I think into this scenario, I, I, I'm not sure that I am able to link, to connect to the different uh, lines of thought with what I'm saying right now, but I, I, I have the, I, I feel the need also to, to read, <laughs> to reread also your response to our book. Um, uh, because I think it also shows a possible way where from where we could continue from there. Jenny, I'm just going to jump in just to say we've got uh, just under 15 minutes um, left. So I wonder if we want to open the um, the floor to the to questions from from the audience. Any comments? Please put them in the chat box or raise your hand. Uh, and maybe we we hear a little bit from from Jacob, no, as well. And sorry, yeah. yes, please, please, and then we can, yeah, and then we'll do that. Sorry about that, Jacob. Yeah. yeah. No, well, yes, yes, just a short reflection. I and mean, first of all, uh, it's very uh, thrilling and on, on, honor to hear this uh, reflection from from Matt. Uh, some numbers of interesting points, and and uh, of course the. The Leosian theme is, is very relevant, and I think uh, you made a very clear distinction there where, where sort of fear she does something else still that has to do with trauma. Um, and then the 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 thing with Walter Benjamin is also has has um, occurred to me, um, especially on the on the we spoke of a, a, a language of catastrophe, uh, and, and I, I was thinking of one sort of point here: the intersection between Benjamin and Ferenczi, and and that goes to the um, angel. And uh, uh, Raluca's pointed out the the Orpha psychic fragment. He calls Orpha as like a, a guardian angel that can sort of occur via uh, a careful mastering of what we call it of the transparent situation that is very uh, humble in a sense and also attentive to to uh, different uh, forms of, of language, different layers of time, different uh, parts of a subject that is not, not a totality. Um, and and you can perhaps think this this idea of the angel there uh, very much connected to a Jewish intellectual uh, understanding of uh, the Jewish traditions uh, that was I think very important in the early twentieth uh, century and. Uh, um, so I think that 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 is something that I've been thinking of of trying to develop. Um, that was just a short short reflection there. Thank you. Thank you, um, Joseph. Would you like to? I would, and I it's a, use a Yiddish word beshert. Jacob uh, offered me the segue of some Jewish thinking. I'm a Rikurian, and I am uh, also a rabbi. And I'm doing research 
on Buber 100 years later, and uh, his I and Thou is literally 100 years old, published in 1923. Um, it was published out of all of the trauma and catastrophe that Jenny described uh, as the milieu out of which others came. Uh, Ricoeur, of course, has spent a great deal of time giving us a hermeneutic frame for Freud. So now the question becomes, and I'm grateful for this book, uh, can we look at the politicization and weaponization of trauma and catastrophe in contemporary discourse? And C, that we need some, some midpoint, uh, what I call the uh, somewhere in between, what Buber needs, the svishin. Can we help each other? Because the extremes are, are dangerous right now. And many of them lay claim to trauma and catastrophe as ways of um, protective walls, statements of siloing. So thank you for your project. Uh, Jacob, I, I will reach out to you. Uh, there is some wonderful shared Jewish ideas here. Uh, it's, it's not happenstance that both Buber and Freud come from Vienna and that when Buber came back, he went to the University of Vienna and, and mm. he started there. Mm. So thank you and congratulations. Mm. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, th thank you. Just a brief um, comment in um, saying that um, I guess um, the way we work in the book is to offer this ramified vocabulary around trauma, which destabilizes trauma as the core concept or catastrophe. Um, I don't think that if we only had those two terms, we could get very far. It's precisely about uh, um, talking in terms of radical plasticity and then materializing them with these other images of protective bladders and um, protective formations that are also the, the sort of result of, of the trauma. So um, I guess to recoil totally from the use of the word trauma um, would be perhaps wrong in this context, no? Because um, Ferenczi used that, that word, um, but he used other words as well, like uh, shock, Shock is very important as well. Um, but to have the critical conversation um, is also important. So my strategy, I guess, would be to not drop that, that word that I agree is very loaded, um, as, as well as catastrophe and crisis. No? So all these are fully fledged debates, not just terms already. Um, but I guess we explode them in a particular way by using Ferenczi's own language and our own reconstruction of it. So thank you very much for this point. It's, uh, uh, in a way, it's a crucial um, point of, of engagement and going forward, I think. Um, anyone else? <clears throat> or um, I haven't looked at the chat. Um, I mean, yeah. If yeah, there's... Not, yeah, no, nobody's asked in the chat yet. But just a reminder that there's um, there's a discount code for the book um, and the link to the Leuven University Press website for the book. So please use that um, if you would like to, to purchase the book. Um, yeah, I think we have time for, for one more question if anyone wants to um, to chime in. Okay, well, maybe I don't um, know. Could I, sorry, could I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, just um, just on on trauma, I suppose, because it is so ubiqu ubiquitous now, 
And some of us work with patients and clients who haven't a had a trauma, but they still want change. They want change without trauma. So how can we address that clinically? Um, yeah, that, I think that's um, that's a quite difficult um, um, question in a sense because also um, I think uh, as I as I tried to point earlier for fairency, um, trauma is a theory of the subject. So in a way, um, if um, perhaps some people refuse um, that idea that they were a subject of uh, profound suffering in, in some way. Um, but um, by assumption, I guess with the assumption we we, we work um, with in a Ferencian clinic, um, we would know that uh, at, at a particular point we will bump into something that uh, Michael Balin calls the basic fault, you know? mm. some kind of wound that, that is there and um, sooner or later presents itself in some way. I don't know if Jacob um, or, or Jenny, for that matter, want to, to add anything or... Mm -hmm. But it's one short reflection, perhaps, that... that, that um perhaps that's that that is in line with what you're saying that that uh, to me it's not like fear and she offers a um sort of um method in the sense of a manual uh, but it's very important to me that that uh, reading for instance is critical diary clinical diary it, 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 it's so profoundly uh, sort of um, um, humble to um, the difficulty in the situation um, and working sort of with himself as an instrument uh, 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 concerning what 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 are my reactions and, and you know they can be sort of strange it seems strange perhaps like uh, how how he, he reacts uh, late in the evening or 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 going to 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 an opera and feeling this or that and and so 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 he's with all his sort of body and 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 mind and 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 uh, um self uh, um sort of trying to figure out something and 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 this this uh, is, is often painful i think painful our processes you know um and and uh and, and not be afraid of this and i think that was is one i think um th there's a trace in the in the, in the clinical diary that he's sort of um disappointed with for him sort of not 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 um approaching this abyss as he calls the 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 the, the transference um situation mm. It's interesting you talk about opera. Um, I went to the Royal Opera House last night to see Rosalka, which is, it has a theme of hydrophilia, of the connection with water. Um, and again, you know, I think that's a really, it's been very interesting kind of listening to, to that kind of theme in, in the book and Ferenzi's work. I mean, how do we, how do we begin to kind of connect with that? Because I'm thinking more about kind of environmental issues, you know, to, to recognize our kind of deep connection to, to our origins really, our natural origins. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Jenny has a thought on this. How fear and see helps us relate to our natural origins. Yeah, because if, if we're thinking about trauma, I mean, we're going through something traumatic at the moment, aren't we, with climate change, but actually we're not connecting with it as being traumatic. Actually, so many people are in denial. Well, I think this idea of an origin, a pure origin, is something that is... Uh, that for me doesn't really belong into Ferenczi's way of thinking. Um, he moves away from um, this kind of, these theories of degeneration that assume a pure origin and uh, the rest is, is, is like a fault. There is no, 
pure origin. There's no back to the real roots kind of thing in his way of relating to it. And I think that is important because of course, in times of crisis, uh, we long for something earlier, something more pure. But uh, the focus that he lied, he, the, he puts the focus on the fact that this is also neurotic and that we have to be careful uh, in um, uh, um, claiming to um, to have an access even to the idea of something that is pure in the origin. And this is also what really, really differs Freudian thinking from Jung. And in this respect, I see parents on the side of Freud, not of Jung, that the origin is not pure. This was what Jung hated in Freud, the idea that the child is already neurotic <laughs> and that the origins are not pure. Um, and I think the most important thing we can learn from Ferenczi's way of dealing with these things is, is, is to be very cautious here uh, when we talk about nature and, and what he sets in motion with his counter narrative of evolution is in a way disturbing all the narratives that we are used, be they used to, be they narratives of progress, everything is better and higher and higher, or be they narratives of degeneration, okay, now we have lost the pure origin and everything's going downwards. It's a way to try to think that that um, um, leaves this kind of a binary behind and makes it a lot more complicated. So, so I would really say to read Ferenczi is to allow these relations to be really, really complicated. And, and that is the most important thing I think we can learn from reading Freud and Ferenczi in, in times of crisis. Mm. To be so careful you, with these longings. I'm yeah. so sorry, I'm going to just have to, we're just past um, seven now. Um, so we have to let, let everybody go. And I'm sorry, Mark, for not having time to, to get to your question. Perhaps you can maybe contact the speakers and they might be able to take your question that way. Um, but just to say thank you so much to our speakers for such a rich and stimulating and, and just intricate kind of dialogue and, and series of, of, of conversations really with one another. Um, and we've been so happy to, to be able to host your book launch today. And thank you for everyone for coming. Um, the, again, the link to buy the, the copy of the book is is um, is in the chat, and uh, there's a code discount code there as well. So please do do look look at that. Take care, everybody. Thank thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Recording stopped.